the next 12 to 18 months could be very interesting. It's very realistic that you might see an eight to 10 year bull run similar to what you saw when the gold ETF was launched. Michael Saylor saying on the record that his vision and his goal is to make MicroStrategy a trillion dollar company on some profit level, you know, MicroStrategy has now outperformed Microsoft. What are your thoughts on Microsoft actually maybe going ahead and, and buying Bitcoin? My gut feeling is that the vote's going to be close, but that it's going to be approved and they're going to do it. We're in totally uncharted territories as far as institutional and nation state adoption. MicroStrategy in particular is going to be one of, if not the biggest stories in corporate finance ever. If you can just print as much money as you want, why are you taxing us? <laughs> why am I being taxed? If you can just print money at will, like it blows my mind. It makes no sense. Bitcoin is good for the individual, the family, the company, the country. Maybe you should buy some Bitcoin. <laughs> the more doors people can walk through to get to Bitcoin, the better. If you don't own Bitcoin, you will be poor. The ECB literally came out and said that a week ago. Bitcoin is going to go to whichever jurisdiction it's treated best. Money is a very powerful motivator and causes people to take certain action. Within the next five to 10 years, we're going to be living in a world that we cannot imagine right now. From a tax standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from a freedom standpoint, I think it's going to be amazing. MicroStrategy will be a Bitcoin bank, and I think that all of the existing traditional banks will be Bitcoin banks. I think you'll be able to walk into a branch in your hometown and you'll be able to buy Bitcoin. By the way, in my research, I came to know that uh, from where I first saw you, it was on the best business show. I was religiously looking at that show uh, back in like 2020, I think 2020 and 2021, they, they had that show going. Uh, and I, I love that show in my orange building moments. Now, I think they don't even do it any, anymore in that format. But from there, I, I knew I was like, ah, I know this guy from some somewhere. <laughs> really cool. Um, and you, I also saw that you're in the same studio as Pump. Uh, is, is that it's the same where, where you record your, your podcast? How is that uh, relationship going? Yeah, so he's been very gracious in, um, uh, he had posted on Twitter about his investor exchange program. I wanted to bring a few people into the office so they could work on their own stuff, but out of his office. And um, so I've been here for a few months now and uh, now he's been very gracious with um, giving me an, an office to work out of. So I'm not working from home. Um, I was in Freedom Tower uh, for about a year in 2021 during COVID um, just to get out of the house and have some place to go that wasn't a coffee shop. Um, but I ended up not going there very often because uh, it was I was on the Upper West Side at that point and it was maybe 30 minutes to get down there. And so I, I gave up that office space, was just working from home. And um, Anthony was, uh, yeah, invited me in kind of like a networking idea to uh, get people together and instead of just um, that this is my version of it not his but uh, you know instead of just meeting someone for five minutes or 15 minutes at a networking event to kind of like you know work out the same office and get to you know have a few conversations so that led to me working out a deal to uh, use the uh, studio that's here to record some episodes and so yeah it's been quite the uh, wild journey so far. And yeah, Anthony's been uh, very helpful and gracious. So very cool. Really cool. I, I love that a lot. Yeah, he was very, um, he was very uh, important for me from the orange pilling, like the first like half year or something like that. Uh, and you also talk a lot about microstrategy, at least that's that's what comes to my my feed with, with your guests and, and microstrategy. Um, uh, why are you like, wh why the focus on, on microstrategy for you? Yeah, so <laughs> I was just telling someone in the office uh, part of this story this morning, and I, I haven't really shared it. So my orange pill moment was in January of 2021. Uh, one of the uh, gentlemen that I work with, um, with the private equity work that I do, um, got, you know, was allocating to Bitcoin back in May of 2017. And he has a macroeconomic background. And so he spent a lot of time with me, um, walking me through the macro, the history of money, um, money printing, just all of these concepts that seem very obvious to me now, <laughs> but until you have someone kind of put their arm around you and say, Hey, here's what's really going on and, and walk alongside you. Um, I guess it's not obvious. 
And so I started allocating to Bitcoin in January of 2021 and uh, just kept dollar cost averaging and smash buying <laughs> Bitcoin whenever I could. Um, and then uh, f- earlier this year, I was invited out to Las Vegas to attend the, um, I shouldn't say to attend, I was invited out uh, to hang out with some friends in Las Vegas. They were attending the MicroStrategy 2024 World Conference. And I should have gotten a ticket and walked through the door. Um, I didn't. I was just kind of in and out. We had a lot of fun. We rented a couple of fancy cars and drove around the Red Rock Canyon and, and you know, outside the city and, you know, just kind of. Uh, that was very, very fun. And just, you know, spent some quality time, went out and had dinner with everybody. Um, and this is kind of embarrassing. So we're, we're driving these cars around, we're getting out at Red Rock Canyon and kind of just like climbing up the rocks a little bit, taking some pictures. I was paying so little attention to MicroStrategy as a company, although I had watched every Michael Saylor video that YouTube possesses in its library, that uh, on the flight out to Vegas, I was on my phone and I'm like, well, I don't want to feel like I'm not part of this crew. So I bought one share of MicroStrategy. I'm like, all right, now I'm in, <laughs> right? And we're standing there um, in front of these rocks, just chatting. And I said, hey, guys, just so you know, you know, that I'm not a faker. I, I, on the way, on the flight here, I bought one share of MicroStrategy. And they're like, oh, that's great. And now looking back now, I'm like, that's pretty embarrassing actually, but that was the beginning of my journey. And it wasn't that long ago. It was whenever that conference was in the spring. So, you know, I am a, for me, owning something, even if it's one share, then I'm looking at it, I'm seeing what it's doing. Um, I'm paying attention to it. So, um, a few months ago, I was kind of looking at what the Bitcoin price action was doing, which was nothing, right? It's going sideways summer, 58,000 to 72,000 more or less um, for a while, right? Most of this year after kind of the excitement around the ETF launch in January. And so I thought, um, you know, I don't know. I love Bitcoin. I love all of the different aspects of it, but I also like that the number goes up. (laughs) And so... I just happened to be looking at one of the Bloomberg analysts posts on Twitter the day that one of the leveraged ETF products on top of MicroStrategy came out, 1.75x leverage per day. And I thought, hmm, that looks interesting. I should uh, read the prospectus and carefully consider it. So what I did instead is I just threw $10,000 into the ETF on day one without reading anything. Um, but again, then it, then it had my attention and I messaged my, uh, uh, one friend, I said, Hey, I just threw 10 grand into this MSTX ETF. Um, what do you think about it? And, uh, right. It's kind of like a little test case. And he sends me a screenshot back with him buying like way more than that, a decent position, especially for day one of an ETF trading. So at the end of the day, I, uh, texted him. I said, well, between you and me, mostly him. (laughs) We had like 0.1% of the day one inflows for that ETF. And so I was like, all right. So, uh, you know, over that weekend, I think it launched on Wednesday or Thursday, that weekend I read through the prospectus and like got my mind around. It's like 1.75X per day, not per year. (laughs) And just all of these nuances and, you know, we're hearing some rumblings on Twitter about, you know, concerns about decay or like, I'm just not that technical finance background guy to really delve into all of that. So, um, yeah, started looking into all of that, but you know, had had and still have zero experience, um, or education, you know, even self-education around options, um, and trading options. So I was like, well, this is, for me, I viewed it as my best shot of kind of getting leverage on top of MicroStrategy, which is leverage long on Bitcoin. Um, so I can hold my Bitcoin stack, but also have MicroStrategy, um, you know, stock and leverage long ETFs and or options to, um, you know, and the thought for me was, well, 
if Bitcoin's volatility is going down from a 70 or 80 vol asset to a 40, 50, 60 vol asset, then maybe I should be allocating some new capital that I have coming in to um, something that has a higher volatility for and you know higher likelihood of um, outsized returns. So that was my uh, pretty embarrassing, but you know it is what it is kind of story into microstrategy. Really interesting. Uh, it's kind of a, a leverage on Bitcoin. Uh, with MicroStrategy and then a leverage on, on MicroStrategy. For those who don't know, what does 1.7x per day mean and what's the difference between per day and per year? Uh, how much are we talking? What, what's the, the finances behind, behind that? So um, for easier math, I'll talk about the MSTU ETF, and I am not an expert on these ETFs, to be clear, um, but it's 2x the micro the price action on micro strategy on a per day basis so from market open to market close so to speak it's going to go up two times what micro strategy does uh per day so if micro strategy is at a dollar and it goes to two dollars then that etf will double that price performance in that day and then it'll start from that point the next day so kind of compounding upon itself and maybe at least for myself, the way I view it is if the price of MicroStrategy, which is different from the price action of Bitcoin, right? If the price of MicroStrategy is chopping sideways or going down, then that levered long ETF is, is not something that you're going to want to be holding because it's most effective when the price is going up. So, um, yeah, that's how I kind of think about that. Really interesting. Do you think that Mike's strategy, I and mean, there's some some talks around that, uh, I don't know if it's it's possible, but do you think that uh, Mike's strategy has a fair chance of being one of the really big companies, like uh, one of the, the, the major companies uh, with like Apple, Google and the ones because they have been accumulating so early in Bitcoin, maybe they even bring something, uh, so, some uh, providers and services around Bitcoin out? I do. I mean, you have Michael Saylor, um, saying on the record during interviews now that he his his vision and his goal is to make microstrategy into a trillion dollar company and i think it's interesting that uh not even several weeks after he came out and publicly said that you have microsoft uh putting up for a vote whether or not to adopt bitcoin as a treasury st strategy um and the reality that I don't want to misquote the exact metric, but on, on some earnings or profit level, you know, MicroStrategy has now outperformed Microsoft. Um, and I mean, even the on the ground reality of it, um, one of my friends and I were walking um, in Midtown, we're recording on a Tuesday, so on Saturday or Sunday, we were walking, we walked past the Microsoft store. We were walking toward the Apple store. We look in the Microsoft store and um, I should have taken a picture to kind of do a side by side. It was completely empty. I mean, there were employees standing in there in the Microsoft store that kind of from the front almost looks like an Apple store, right? It's very kind of like, like a sleek, cool, all glass and like the light wood tables. So it was just empty. And then we go, we walk into the Apple store and it's, first of all, I either didn't know or forgot that the one here um, in Manhattan, basically on Central Park South, kind of across from the Plaza Hotel, it's open 24 hours a day. It never closes. What? <laughs> and, and so, and it's kind of always humming to pr pretty busy. Um, we go there and I mean, I have pictures on my phone. It's packed. I mean, it's like... Wow. I mean, yeah, it's the weekend, it's New York, but it's just packed. So, um, yeah, I don't know how much Microsoft is, you know, selling to the public if their store is completely empty in Manhattan on a Sunday and the Apple store is just, and, you know, MicroStrategy doesn't have a, a retail store that I'm aware of, so I, I can't make that comparison. But, I mean, you just see some of these things with your eyes and you're like, all right, um, the times are changing and, and yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that if there's anyone 
uh, and any team that can pull off uh, going to the top of the leaderboard and becoming a trillion dollar company from a not even $50 billion company right now. It's definitely MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor. So it'd be, it's very intriguing to watch all of this play out in real time. Absolutely. And it's already outperformed since they adopted Bitcoin. Every single as and 500 companies so are like, it's already kind of playing out that, uh, uh, that, that, that vision is already kind of playing out. Um, it's also interesting that you touched on Microsoft because, because uh, before I just thought like, ah, it's just like they put something out, but the more and more I research about it and hear about it, uh, I feel like it, they, they might actually do it. <laughs> and my last guest actually said like, oh, I, it's it's for sure they will do it. What, what are your thoughts on, on Microsoft actually maybe going ahead and, and buying Bitcoin? My gut feeling is that the vote's going to be close, but that it's going to be approved and they're going to do it. I, I don't know, and I haven't seen any real analysis on the facts around or the reality around BlackRock being their second largest shareholder and how that vote would go or how any of these votes would really go when you get down into the details. But my gut feeling is that, um, you know, it could be a close vote, but I have I find it far fetched that um, they would put something up for a vote and be that public about it unless behind the scenes they were like, hey, this is, we're going to be doing this. It's super interesting uh, to watch. Also, the CTO, I think, came out and said something like, oh, I, I underestimated it and uh, it, it's really good and it has the possibility to change society. I, I misquoted, but uh, something along those lines. So, that would be huge if, if Microsoft, it's almost hard to confuse those two, uh, comes in. Yeah. I mean, talk about the game theory of the Magnificent Seven all adopting Bitcoin. I mean, don't forget, Tesla already has it on its balance sheet. It's, you know, so on the company level and the country level, I think the next few months and definitely the next 12 to 18 months could be very interesting. And um, I would even go so far as to say that if you play this game theory out, it, I don't, I think it's very realistic that you might see an eight to 10 year bull run with volatility, sim similar to what you saw when the gold ETF was launched. So um, with volatility, meaning, right, you might see a 30, 40, 50% drawback, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, have discussed with, you know, a few others that you could see less of a bear market or even a, eliminate the bull market if just micro strategy themselves can execute uh, their playbook with a lot of precision and with increasing size. So I, th yeah, I think we're in totally uncharted territories as far as adoption and you know, institutional and nation state adoption. I think MicroStrategy in particular is going to be one of, if not the biggest stories in corporate finance ever. <laughs> so I, I think when people start to see it more and more on uh, mainstream news, it, people might start paying attention. But I think we're very early at Coin and even earlier to these uh, corporations adopting it. Yeah, it's it's super interesting. I, I want to talk about uh, what, what's what's to come also with the next eight to ten years. I think even Michael Saylor talked in Madeira about this possible gold rush era of the next ten years. Um, but one thing that I forgot before with MicroStrategy, um, what are the kind of the plans that MicroStrategy has? Because they kind of they still have this. Uh, still they have this huge uh, operational business that has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Uh, and they have this huge, like a lot of Bitcoiners are involved with MicroStrategy. A lot of Bitcoiners are invested in MicroStrategy. So it just seems to be a normal step over the next uh, years and decades that they actually evolve their operational business also more to, towards the Bitcoin community and the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, do you have some insights where, where, where I mean, not insights, but like some something that they maybe said um, where MicroStrategy is going from an operational standpoint? Sure. I mean, I have random hatchet thoughts from some, you know, 
internet guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yes, I think it makes sense that to the extent possible, the software business will continue incorporating more and more Bitcoin development features, anything that they can do that makes sense. But just the software business throwing off that consistent cash flow, whether they are developing Bitcoin centric products and technologies or not, is really a key part of what makes the whole thing work. And I would even go a step further and say that it would make complete sense. And I think MicroStrategy has publicly said this, that they may consider purchasing other cash flow positive businesses and adding that to their operation in order to have more free cash flow in order to um, utilize that in their flywheel to ultimately be able to uh, purchase more Bitcoin. So um, I think, you know, certainly it makes sense that they could, they could and would incorporate Bitcoin into their products. Um, but I think even if it's just a business intelligence software, and even if they decided to acquire um, other businesses that had nothing to do with uh, Bitcoin, that that would be all within their um, corporate flywheel of what would make like absolute 100% sense to uh, continue what they're doing with adding Bitcoin as fast as possible to their corporate treasury. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting also for me to see, uh, because even like, like it starts from an individual level, it starts on, uh, on that level, and then it goes up to corporations, but even maybe at some point nation uh, state level, uh, where the allocation of capital uh, completely changes when your um, asset is accumulating on a really, really fast pace like Bitcoin. Uh, compared to you have an asset like a euro or dollar or like some bond or some, some something like that, that, then you're way more incentivized to to kind of go into uh, let's buy another a lot of companies out. So it's it's really interesting how maybe MicroStrategy is also doing that because they already have this amazing treasury, uh, but they can use the treasury to further buy more bitcoin or to further buy some other cash flow i think this 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 like line of like okay do i buy more bitcoin with that now or do i uh, buy other business with that is the business actually outgrowing uh, the bitcoin long term i think that's a really interesting thing when bitcoin 
becomes the new hurdle rate uh, for corporations. I mean, even on, on an individual level, it's interesting. Uh, do, do you want to in, invest in, uh, in, in, in that new, new company or you want to keep uh, your own small thing going and maybe invest it in, in Bitcoin? So like, it's, it's really interesting. Um, how we will do that that balance of that especially because bitcoin is so growing so so fast how do you see that yeah i just think the writing's on the wall i mean the microsoft announcement for their vote was just kind of like i don't think on most people's bingo cards for 2024 i was like and it's december 10th right now it's the end of october i mean this stuff is going to be coming fast like really fast um but even the Semler Scientifics and other companies in the Russell 2000 that, like, better or worse, they, they, they're positive cash flow companies, but they're kind of zombie companies from a growth standpoint. It just makes sense for all of them <laughs> to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. I mean, I don't think, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I'm, feeling the pain of Michael Saylor every time that he, like, I can just relate to him going, and then he starts talking again because it's like, Bitcoin is good for the individual, the family, the company, the country. I mean, it's just like, maybe you should buy some Bitcoin. <laughs> it's just like, even conversations I have with friends, extended family, uh, people on the street, um, it's just, I'm like, oh, Tim, what are you, you know, they'll see, uh, you know, some of the videos I've recorded. Oh, so now you're some guy on the internet talking about Bitcoin. And I'm like, yeah, I just, and they're like, oh, cool. Yeah. I don't really know anything about it. I mean, that's, that's how early we are. And so as many people say, corporations, companies, they're just made up of people. And when I walk around the streets, very few people, you know, since January of 2021, 99% of people I've talked to, I mean, some people literally, I'll ask, you know, oh, yeah, what do you think about Bitcoin? I've literally had someone say to me as we're just walking along, oh, is that still a thing? <laughs> I mean, it's just we're early. We're so early that it's uh, and it's hard because of the, the price bias, the number bias. When someone sees $70,000 Bitcoin, and they don't know anything about it. They don't know that there's a hundred million Satoshis in one Bitcoin. They don't know that you can buy a dollar of Bitcoin or even less, right? You can buy one Satoshi. Yeah, it's, we're just so early. It's almost unfathomable just you know, to anyone that's really been studying Bitcoin for a number of months or years to go out into the actual world and see that very few people even have, you know, maybe the desire, but I really, I think everyone or most people are trying the best that they can. I mean, they have families, they have jobs, they have um, just a lot of commitments that to actually spend 10 hours studying Bitcoin to come to the conclusion that the government's going to ban it. That's a lot of time for them. And then they're at that stage where they're just like, okay, well, the government's going to ban Bitcoin. So cool. I'm good. <laughs> and so like who has a hundred hours to study Bitcoin? Um, it's, it's definitely the highest and best use of anyone's time to study Bitcoin. But after a hundred hours, you're like, okay, well it's digital gold. And so, yeah, maybe I'll buy it and it'll reach the market cap of gold someday. And, uh, you know, but that seems, and I'm speaking of like, you know, someone just try, trying to go on the journey. Well, that seems a little, unrealistic because that'd be, and I'm going to mess up the numbers here, right? 700, 800, $900,000 of Bitcoin. You're like, well, that's ridiculous. That's never going to happen. And like most people are just not, uh, I shouldn't say most, a lot of people are not numbers people. They're not finance people. They're not curious or open people. They're just trying to live their lives and do the best they can for their families. I think the more avenues and the more doors we have for people to walk through, um, whether it's studying Bitcoin and um, learning and embracing self-custody or whether it's buying it on an exchange or whether it's buying it through an ETF or whether 
someone is talking to their friends and they're saying, oh, there's this equity micro strategy that no one's ever heard of and it's really outperforming, you know, I bought some, you know, maybe you should buy some or, right? Like, this is what I'm doing. And then your buddy's like, oh, maybe I'll buy some micro strategy. It's just an equity. You're not even talking about Bitcoin. And I'm not saying that that's the right door to go through. I'm just saying, I think the reality is some of that, you know, might be happening. So Bitcoin's for everyone. So the more doors people can walk through to get to Bitcoin, I think the better. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I think it's fascinating how early we are. There are those, um, like, you just have to go out in the street and ask people uh, what they think. You just have to go out in, in your uh, faraway family, maybe that you didn't bother too much till now with Bitcoin and ask them about Bitcoin. Um, uh, some of them maybe get that the euro or the dollar is not the best vehicle to store value. <laughs> so some are that, that far already. Uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, one of the episodes I put out, the gentleman I work with here, um, doing the recording and editing. He's like, Hey, wh what do you think the title for this one should be? And I just texted him. Uh, if you don't own Bitcoin, you will be poor. And he was like, Oh, I like that title. And it's like, I'm not trying to be, um, uh, dramatic. Like you, li literally, if you look on YouTube in the description, in the show notes, it just says like the reason I titled that video, if you don't own Bitcoin, you will be poor is because the ECB literally came out and said that a week ago, they said, Bitcoin's unfair. Bitcoin's so unfair because if you don't own Bitcoin, and that was your conclusion, if you don't own Bitcoin, you will be poor. You're like, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just trying to like use my time and my skills and my talents to like, what's the highest and best use of my talents, ability and time? Well, going around and trying to like talk one-on-one -on -one with people about Bitcoin is sometimes fun, sometimes rewarding sometimes very frustrating. <laughs> and so I feel very strongly that the best thing I can do with my time is educate people about Bitcoin. And the best platform to do that is social media, the internet, where whoever wants to educate themselves or get information and obviously make their own decisions from a financial and legal <laughs> and all these different aspects, we're not giving them advice. We're trying to put information out there to make it um, you know, hopefully make it entertaining. Right. I, I do think you don't really have effective education without some sort of entertainment aspect to it. Um, and that's not to say that you have to like, you know, do cartwheels or like jump up and down or, you know, put on a silly hat, but think the ease, and, and maybe this is different from ent the entertainment part of it, the ease with which someone can pull up YouTube or any other platform put in some AirPods and go for a walk and listen to some information on a video. It's so easy for so many people to do now that I think like, that's just, it's such an, a wonderful platform to put the information out there. And it's like a buffet. If people want some corn, they want some hot dogs, they want some salad, they want some green beans, they can choose whatever they want. Um, and we're not forcing it on them, right? I'm not ruining a family relationship because all I want to do is talk about Bitcoin. Um, and I've been there, right? I've ruined hopefully many relationships over it, but yeah, the community on Twitter, the community in real life, whether you're meeting people organically in your circle that they, you know, enjoy talking about Bitcoin or whether you're finding those people on Twitter or wherever else online, and then meeting them at an event um, and having that relationship kind of flourish from there. I mean, I just think that you know, it's kind of, I think it's obvious that like, that's the better route to go, right? You're not trying to like convince anyone of anything. You're, um, you know, studying and educating yourself and then having conversations and putting those conversations out there. Um, for whoever wants to partake in them. And, and I think it's a really powerful way to, to start a conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I was just going with that. Uh, the, the video that I saw last time um, was fascinating. People uh, were asking other people what the current price of Bitcoin is. <laughs> and and that was like, oh, like, 
normal people probably know at least a little bit of the Bitcoin price, uh, even though they know nothing else. Like the, the Bitcoin price is the first thing they see because it's in all the headlines. If it makes all them highs or all them, uh, all, uh, some lows or something like that, uh, so. Uh, that I was for like, ah, it will be probably not that bad. But people said anything, like they said like, ah, what, two euros or like, ah, oh, 20 euros. Like, I was like, what? <laughs> they they're saying yeah. anything. And the, I think the highest someone said was 20,000. And this was to a time uh, where Bitcoin was way up <laughs> than that. So that it's really fascinating to see uh, how, how early we actually are. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of unbelievable. I think Jack Dorsey with Cash App in particular, um, has tried to make the the price where you can switch between Bitcoin and Satoshis and dollars as far as what the display is, is trying to maybe further that conversation in a positive direction. Because again, and, and actually the ETFs, right? BlackRock, Fidelity, Bitwise, all of these ETFs, when you go into your brokerage account and you can buy one share of the Bitwise Bitcoin ETF for whatever the price is, I don't know what it is, $30, $10, $70, whatever that share price is, $200, whatever it is. I go, okay, well, yeah, I can buy a share or I can buy 10 shares or a hundred shares of this ETF. And you know, that, that makes, I mean, I know for myself that, you know, Kind of puff out my chest and say, oh, yeah, I own 100 shares of the, uh, you know, Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, you know, I'm in the game. But when you go to an exchange and you're like, well, I only got 0. 0.0001 Bitcoin for the same price, like it just, I think, psychologically really does a number on people. So, um, yeah, the more that we can talk about, you know, kind of switching that unit of account to Satoshi's or people buying the ETFs or, you know, even the 10 for one stock split on MicroStrategy. I think, you know, for whatever multiple reasons they did that, right? I, I'm sure people enjoy buying one share for $50 or $100 rather than $1,000. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think all, all of those things are very helpful um, for the human condition when it comes to adoption. I just looked up, it's it's $40. So it's actually really nice uh, to, have to have a Bitcoin price that is at un under hundred dollars, even though it's like Bitcoin ETF, but uh, it's, uh, I think that that's a good uh, good thing. I never looked at that. Uh, it's interesting to, to, to see that, yeah, very cool. Also the ETC, ECP, I think one other aspect, what you brought up with that paper uh, was they are kind of, <laughs> at like Bitcoin to 10 million price target in there, uh, where they made oh, this really? example with 10 million uh, euros per, per Bitcoin. It was really fascinating to see that paper because yeah, the, 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 the underlying um, f message that I got from the paper is like, they are scared. <laughs> they are like, yeah. we, we have to, uh, we cannot stop it now. Let, let's tax it uh, <laughs> massively. That's kind of the, the message that I got from that paper. Uh, and it's really interesting to see how, how this uh, goes with with the uh, ECP. I hope uh, taxes are not increasing in, in Europe. Otherwise, I might have to leave here. <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's super interesting because whether certain organizations or countries are putting out papers that they truly believe that or they're saying it for a multitude of specific reasons bitcoin is going to go to whichever jurisdiction it's treated best so like right the uae the united states el salvador i think if all of these countries are not already understanding of this they will be very shortly that yeah, if you want to put a tax that's that's higher than some other jurisdiction on Bitcoin, you're going to see those flows go flow out <laughs> and go somewhere else. And yeah, maybe you'll tax it, you know, for that on that one time exit event. But you know, money is a very powerful um, motivator and causes people to take certain actions. And so, um, I'm not saying that. You know, no one should ever tax anything. But um, on the other hand, you know, strong believer in the meme, 
if you can just print as much money as you want, why are you taxing us? <laughs> why am I being taxed if you can just print money at will? Like it blows my mind. It makes no sense. Why am I being taxed? You could just print the money. And and like that's the whole system is so messed up that like I'm not, you know, you shouldn't be printing money. That's not the solution. But if that's the fiat world that we're in, like you have some political candidates around the world saying, oh, well, you know, if we increase or do certain tariffs, then maybe we'll get rid of some of these taxes. And when you look on a, lo a longer time frame, not the last 10 years or the last 20, 30, 50 years, but 100, 200 years ago, some of these countries didn't have tax or they had tax for a certain reason. And then after a certain time, it was gone. There was no more tax. But then, you know, they started taxing again <laughs> and you just keep taxing and taxing and taxing. I think within the next five to 10 years, we're going to be living in a world that we cannot imagine right now from a tax standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from a freedom standpoint. And I think it's going to be amazing. <laughs> All of my family and friends know that I'm like the ever optimist, like, there's a glass of water. It's not like half full. Like this glass is completely full of water right now. I know it doesn't look like it, but it's completely full of water. Like that's how optimistic I am about our future. And I, when I say our future, I mean all of, the, all of humanity. And the reason for it comes down to Bitcoin. I love that a lot. Yeah, really cool. I think uh, Bitcoin is, could, could usher in some, um, it sounds romantic, but I think uh, Asher in abundance, uh, it actually could happen. What what Bitcoin brings, but maybe let's uh, stay a little bit in the in the medium term with the taxes and all the things going on in the ECP. What do you think will be the implications if we actually hit in the next coming years this hundred k, five hundred k, one million price target? What what do you expect? Is is like before we get to this uh, great point, uh, is there like an, uh, an, uh, an ugly, <laughs> ugly time zone in there for Bitcoiners? Is there like, uh, will we try to tax it? Will we try like, what, what do you kind of expect when, when Bitcoin uh, comes up and up uh, in, the, in the price levels and in tension levels in, on, on, the, on the global, uh, uh, global uh, balance sheet of the world? Great question. I think the, and, and you can apply this, I think, to most things in life, the best indicator of anyone's or anything's future performance is their past performance. And so if we look over the last 15 years, was there anything wild or ugly or disruptive, like riots in the streets because of Bitcoin? I mean, maybe there are a few stories here and there that I'm not aware of, but like, it's been a pretty peaceful adoption so far. And I think the fact that you have nation states and cities that have adopted Bitcoin as legal tender, I think the fact that you have BlackRock and Fidelity and Bitwise and all of these institutions in the US and many other countries, um, putting it in this ETF wrapper, I think you'll have the US dollar, you'll have stable coins, and that's your checking account. And then I think you're starting to see conversations just over the past few weeks come more and more to the, the forefront here in the U.S. with certain individuals on mainstream media and podcasts saying that Bitcoin is a commodity. Now, we all know that Bitcoin's a commodity, but many people are kind of holding in their hands and saying, as far as the narrative, that Bitcoin is a commodity but they also say that it's a currency. And if we, can, if we can get away from saying that it's a currency and understand that it's like oil, like it's like corn, Bitcoin is a commodity and whether it should be taxed or not, I think comes, I think where we're going is that Bitcoin as a commodity will not be taxed. I think Bitcoin as a security, if you're trading it um, in some sort of securitized product and making a profit, then that will be taxed. But I think Bitcoin as a commodity, if I go up to you and say, here's a Bitcoin, 
in the same way that I can go up to you and say, here's a barrel of oil. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I don't think as a commodity in the future, it will be taxed. So I think we're just starting to see that and I could be wrong, but that's, that's my thought there. Interesting. So as a commodity, where do you see it then, uh, long-term do you think it's, uh, it will always stay in an asset and then paired with, with fiat, uh, you, you have like fiat as this medium of exchange and unit of account and, and Bitcoin is just this global world reserve asset or commodity, however you want to label it. Is that the, the future you see? Yeah, exactly. I do think that as long as you have nation states, um, you'll have the, the fiat currency. Maybe it will uh, be backed by Bitcoin. Maybe it'll be backed by a basket of uh, currencies and assets, including Bitcoin, gold, silver. Um, I think every sovereign will need to make that decision for themselves. And just like some of the stories that we tell with trying to figure out a new financial product and you need to do experiments, I think you'll see countries do experiments. And I think that's great. I think that's how we learn. And I think, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a future that is very positive. The closer we can get to either using Bitcoin or having a fiat currency that's, that's somehow linked or backed by Bitcoin or a basket of, of, of uh, assets. Again, we're just kind of hopefully inching closer and closer to a more equitable world, which funnily is the exact opposite of what you're hearing from some of these <laughs> nations right now, as far as um, the current FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's, that's coming out. But um, I think it's all part of the adoption and, and all part of the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Really, really cool. Um, before we come to the end routine, I want to uh, know a little bit more about you. Uh, what are you doing with uh, Jubilee Royalty? Do I, do I pronounce it right? Or Jubilee uh, Royalty? Uh, what are you doing there? Yeah, no, I love I love your pronunciation. I might kind of makes it sound more fancy. So I like that. But uh, yeah, Jubilee Royalty is my day job. And uh, so we have historically raised capital and uh, purchased and then strategically, you know, after we let cash flow for a few years, sell energy assets, specifically in natural gas and oil basins here domestically. Yeah, I, I manage those uh, funds in a private equity sort of style. Um, but um, yeah, we're just deploying some capital from the raise that we just did and yeah, managing and, and uh, exiting those uh, vehicles as um, the opportunities. That, arise. So um, that's what I'm doing there. And um, yeah, moving forward, I think it'll be interesting to see um, what opportunities um, present themselves to, uh, you know, either do more in the energy space or, you know, spend some time uh, learning more about the venture capital space and just see where um, the opportunities are either in my traditional background in, um, venture capital, um, and most importantly in Bitcoin, um, and, and where we can intelligently allocate capital to, um, you know, drive adoption forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Really, really cool. I love that a lot. Uh, perfect. And one question that every one of my guests get is what can we learn from you besides, uh, Bitcoin? What can you learn from me besides Bitcoin? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. however you want to, or wherever you want to take this question. Yeah, no, great question. Think on that for a second. I mean, my background's in the energy uh, sector. Um, so negotiating um, leases and purchase agreements and other land agreements with, um, you know, whoever owns that property, whether, whether it's an individual or a corporation, and then, you know, um, negotiating with them and their attorneys. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about um education, being able to um, convey those ideas to other people, whether it's, um, you know, in energy, whether it's in Bitcoin. Um, when I first moved to New York uh, a little over five years ago, I, I took a little pause and I, I said to myself, okay, we've, we've done a few things in life. What should we do now? And, you know, I don't know if it's from a first principles perspective, but I just simply asked my question, 
put myself the question, you know, what do I enjoy doing? Right. Cause you can go do lots of things and try to make a difference in the world or try to make a bunch of money or, you know, whatever you want to do. Like, what do I really enjoy doing? And I really enjoy doing two pe two things. I enjoy meeting people and I enjoy like putting deals together, uh, meaning like business deals or you know, like whatever a win-win is like putting deals together could be as simple as I've met two people and I think they would, uh, really benefit from meeting each other. And so I introduce them and that's not a business deal, but it's just trying to add value. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that people, um, could learn from me, but you know, maybe more to the aspect of what I'm focusing on now with some of these, uh, interviews is like, I think it's, it's so exciting for me personally to be able to meet people and then, you know, have this video, right? I mean, what's a video on the, on YouTube, it's a, it's a digital product. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I just, I guess people, yeah, that's such a good question. What could people learn from you besides, you know, maybe my passion about Bitcoin? Yeah. I might need to, uh, get back to you, back to you on that and put it as a comment in the, uh, in the notes when the, when this comes out, how about that? <laughs> it will come out in around two weeks. So, so you have a lot of time to think about that. <laughs> awesome. I, yeah. I might, I might need two weeks to think about that question. It's very good. So thank you. I mean, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the best questions where you don't immediately have an answer to. I think that that's, uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> maybe it's bad to make uh, a podcast only around those questions, but I, I always try to like get, uh, uh, get, get something new out of a guest. And, uh, may, may, that, that is one question that I found, uh, gets a new side or new rhythm in, in the podcast. So yeah, uh, de definitely an, an, an interesting one gets, gets people thinking really cool. We have an end routine in the podcast where this is also one, one of my routines where I try to, uh, get something new out of a uh, guest or get something new into the podcast. We have an end routine in the podcast where the uh, previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, the question is, will Bitcoin banks be a thing? So that's the question for me. Yeah, that's the question for you from the previous guest. Absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely think Bitcoin banks will be a thing. I think you'll have, um, you know, many, many, many Bitcoin banks. I think MicroStrategy will be a Bitcoin bank. And I think that all of the existing traditional banks will be Bitcoin banks. I think you'll be able to walk into a branch uh, in your hometown and you'll be able to buy Bitcoin and you'll put it in your Bitcoin savings account. And I think that's it's going to be awesome. I love that a lot. By the way, in Germany, it's, uh, there's like a big, uh, brand already doing that, uh, like a traditional bank. They're just like offering now Bitcoin because there are some Bitcoiners in the bank and they just like did that. And they even like throw events with over a thousand people, uh, yearly, uh, really cool Bitcoin things So like banks are like, they, they, they will be friendly to Bitcoin. I think they will not be opposed to Bitcoin. Central banks might be opposed to Bitcoin, but the local commercial banks, not. So I, I love that question from previous guests yeah, and also your answer. Really cool. Thank you so much for your time. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, reach out to you? I'm mostly on Twitter. So I'm at Tim Kotzman on Twitter. And um, also, if you prefer YouTube, yeah, you just go to YouTube and just type in Tip Kotsman and my channel should pop right up. So yeah, appreciate you having me and appreciate all the time. Thank you so much for being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.